and she started rubbing my feet. Her hands were going all up in my toes and I was like, oh, this is a very core traumatic memory that I will not be forgetting. My girl is getting her coin from the same company she's roasting. If that isn't a power move, I don't know what is. This is pretty much the entire premise of the show. I have been on a short series on Netflix's YouTube channel called Flirting with the Enemy, where I catfish real people as villains from their shows. I wanted to film this video to provide more information about how the show even happened and then also do a deeper dive into the things that got cut out in the first two episodes. So if you're curious about the behind the scenes stuff and all of the tea, I am here to provide that with what I'm allowed to provide. But honestly, this is just another way for me to get even more coin. Yes, I'm getting my Netflix check, but I will still get my check on this channel because this video is sponsored by Audible. They are the world's biggest source of spoken word entertainment because they have such a large selection of audiobooks in their library, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to even celebrity entertainment and binge-worthy podcasts. Each month that you're signed up for Audible, you get a credit to spend on any audiobook in their massive library, and you can even save up your credits to use it for later. You can keep your credits up to a year, and you even get access to their Plus catalog. This has thousands of audiobooks, guided meditation, podcasts, original entertainment, and more. Personally, I've been listening to Never Say You Can't Survive by Charlie Jane Anders. This is like a writing slash self-help book. And what's nice about listening to this audiobook specifically is that the author herself is the narrator, so I can literally literally hear her voice through her own writing. I've been listening to audiobooks whenever I cook and it just helps the time go by so much faster. So if you're interested, you can get free 30 days at Audible using my link at audible.com slash readwithcindy or by texting readwithcindy to the number 500-500. Once again, that's audible.com slash readwithcindy or texting readwithcindy to 500-500. So let's dive into the tea of the show. First things first, how the hell did this even happen? A lot of people thought that Netflix reached out to me because of my video posted a while back where I catfished people as the Darkling from Shadow and Bone. This is kind of true, but also not true at the same time. The first time I actually worked with Netflix and started my relationship with them was when they invited me to their writer's room to brainstorm ideas for how to market their shows coming out, specifically book to screen adaptations like Shadow and Bone and to all the boys I've loved before. They wanted to have a booktuber in the room so that I could provide, I guess, more insight to the minds of the fucking losers that are on booktube that would be in their target demographic. So as the representative of all of those losers, I came into the writer's room. We spent the entire day pitching ideas for how to market the shows. I actually have a professional background in advertising. I used to work at an ad agency where pitching ideas for original content was something that I did a lot. I haven't been able to do that now at my current job, but I really missed it so it was nice to get back into the game. I don't know if Netflix had reached out to me because they knew I had a background in advertising or if they had only seen my Sizzle Crows videos and thought to take a chance on me but it did work out that way. It is a pretty strange experience to combine booktube internet bullshit with actual professional shit that I do in real life because I've always separated the two. I view YouTube as a completely separate thing in my life even though I do work in advertising and social media I never saw YouTube as a professional thing that I did. This was the first time where those two worlds kind of merged together, where I was speaking from both of those experiences. So the person leading the writing session was Dana, who works as the editorial and publishing manager at Netflix. Another writer who worked there was Michael, who coincidentally happened to be one of my subscribers, like since I first started my channel. So it's just one of those things where it was like, oh my gosh, what a small world. I'm mentioning those two specific specifically because they're gonna end up being the people that I worked with for flirting with the enemy. One of the ideas that I brought forward was to have one of the actors catfish real people using lines from their characters on their respective shows. I referenced the video that I did as the Darkling from Shadow and Bone. That idea definitely stuck in their minds because later on I saw that they posted a video where the actor of Jesper catfished people using lines as his 
his character. There were two other ideas from the writer's room that also ended up being used. One of them was having a panel conversation between authors that have books in similar genres or similar themes. There would also be a Q&A segment where fans of the books could submit questions. The other concept that ended up becoming an actual thing was having booktubers or mega fans of a book series react to the show that's being adapted. They could see some of the footage ahead of time and give their actual thoughts on whether the show did it right or not and was faithful to the books. When they developed those two ideas, Dana from Netflix reached out to me and said, hey, I would love you to be included in both of these videos. And I said, sure. So if you watch the video with Lee Bardugo and Jenny Han, you'll see a very short clip of me asking them a question. Apparently, Lee Bardugo recognized me. I don't know what to say about that because a lot of my videos are just shit posting about her books. And then for the reaction of Shadow and Bone, I got to see the clips ahead of time and I was just trying to be a clown and trying to say the most out of pocket shit. After we filmed the reactions, I was saying, hey, thanks for inviting me to this and the other thing and that other thing as well. It's been really fun. And Dana said, yeah, absolutely. We love working with you. I've definitely been passing your name around to other people. That was when the gears in my head started turning because I was like, wait, why are they passing my name around to other people? Fast forward a couple weeks later, this is when they reached out to me and said, hey, when are you free for a meeting? We really loved working with you and we want to have another opportunity to do so. So we want to pitch this idea for a show on YouTube. So I took the meeting and they pitched me the idea of the show, which is that it would be a short series on YouTube, five episodes where each episode I would catfish as villains from various popular shows that they have. Pretty much the same format as my Darkling video, but with like a way bigger budget. And I was like, I mean, if you insist, I'm wanting to keep working with me, I guess I'll do it. I believe this show came to be because I had worked with them in these short little bursts. I don't think it was because Netflix watched that one YouTube video and was inspired to make a whole show by it. I'm pretty sure it was just from working with them in all those previous times, having a good relationship with them, where they thought, hey, this bitch is kind of funny and she's easy to work with and she'll do anything for money. My theory for what plays a big part in how this show came to be is probably probably because of all of you. Because when those two videos came out where I appeared in the Q&A and when I reacted to Shadow and Bone, all of you who commented just showed so much love and support and excitement for seeing me on the screen for a few seconds. And I really think Netflix noticed that. They were probably like, this bitch has some clout that we can monopolize. I'm pretty sure that is the final nail in the coffin of me selling out. <laughs> No, but seriously speaking, even though this is a very cheesy moment right now, I do want to say that I am genuinely very appreciative of all of the support and engagement. One of my favorite things about posting any video on my channel is just seeing the comments. That's pretty much like my main motivator to post any video. Because honestly, filming is a drag. Editing myself and having to stare at my fucking face and listen to my voice for hours is a special form of torture. But I go through it anyway because I just really love seeing all the comments. Yeah, it's like a parasocial relationship, but hey, it works for us. I think it has bled all over to Netflix and they noticed that and they decided to pick up on it. And I definitely don't think that the show would be a thing if it weren't for this very weird parasocial relationship that we have. I've seen the comments and responses where you say that you're so proud and supportive and it just makes me feel really gushy inside. Okay. Okay. Even the comments where people have said, you know, I'm not really feeling this show. I feel kind of awkward about it, whatever. And yet people still showed up and supported regardless of whether they enjoyed it or not. I really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Anyway, we're done with the cheesiness, okay? Because this is very uncomfortable. We're not here to show genuine true feelings. We're just here to share the tea with what happened with flirting with the enemy. They had planned from the very beginning for the set to be very bougie and fancy and kind of like dark and villainous to match the whole premise. So this is the original mood board that they had for the show. They definitely wanted something very formal and intimate. They wanted a chase lounge and some curtains and some candles to set up the atmosphere. In terms of the graphic design, they were looking into fancy lettering, obviously figuring out how to show the chat messages that would pop up. The final mood board that the art director came up with changed the colors. So instead of the red that you saw on the original mood board, it was more of like the dark green and velvety kind of look, which 
which I really like a lot better. It's obviously a lot more sophisticated. They wanted to include sheer drapes to create like an entrance for the camera to push through. I'm gonna share some pictures of what the final set looks like when I showed up on the day of filming. I think it's beautiful. I love all the details in it. I love like the little marble statues and the plants in the corner. While all these logistics were happening in the background, this is when we started doing a bunch of writing sessions. These would be online meetings where we would come together to write the episode scripts. Dana was the lead who really helped shape the structure of the episode. Every episode would introduce what the concept was and introduce a character and why he or she or they are so villainous, what's their psyche and why do people still thirst after them. Michael also wrote a lot of the character introductions and he is super funny. I was pretty much just there to help tweak any of like the jokes or add any of my own. So for example, with the Lucifer episode, Michael had this great ongoing joke where we would often refer to Lucifer as demon daddy. And we were kind of bouncing back and forth. And I was like, oh, what if we did like some alliteration where I was like, this is some goddamn demon daddy dick. And the three of us would be like, yeah, that's funny. And so we would just add it to the script. I would say the entire scripts would probably be around half an hour long if we had kept everything. But looking at the final cut, it looks like they had to tone it down to 10 minutes. I think when I do a deep dive into each episode, I'm gonna look back on the jokes that got cut so that you can see all the work that we put into it because I feel like there were some bangers in there. I did see some comments in the first episode with Lucifer that some people felt like the show was too scripted. And to that, I completely understand. I saw a few comments where people were saying like, oh, I wish they allowed Cindy to ad lib more or just improvise. And while I appreciate how much faith you have in me to just improvise and be funny, I don't think that would have gone over as well. There's no way that I would have been able to improvise in a way that was structured and concise in the same way that the scripts were. You might not know this, but I do script my videos, my own YouTube videos ahead of time too. It's not super structured, like in the way that this Netflix show was, but I definitely write my jokes ahead of time. Like when I'm reading a book, the jokes usually come to me while I'm reading the book. So I'll add that in my notes app, or maybe I'm buddy reading with someone and I'll just message them like my thoughts and my jokes. I collect all of that in a Google doc so that I have something to refer to when I actually film the book review. Even for A Court of Thorns and Roses, I had a huge Google doc that was an ongoing list of all of my thoughts as I was reading the book. So my involvement in the episode script, I feel like was pretty similar in that aspect where I really was just adding in my own comments and reactions to the characters or the chats that I had with the daters. Beyond the character introduction, something that we also worked on was the dating profiles for each character. The dating profiles were set up like Hinge where it would be a bunch of prompts for the character to fill out. So it would be things like, on a regular Sunday, you'll find me doing blank. My biggest flaw is blank or what turns me on the most is blank. This was a chance for us to not only paint a picture of the character, but also drop in some red flags. I'll do a deep dive into each of the character profiles in part two, because not everything from the profile was shown in the video, but in actuality, we did fill out a pretty comprehensive profile. The pictures for the dating profiles were not the actual characters. They were stock images, just so that people wouldn't suspect. Not only were they stock photos of hot people, but we also would gender swap a few of the characters too, because it didn't matter what sexual orientation the characters were or the daters were, we just wanted to cover a wide breadth of people. And then outside of the writing sessions, in my free time, I would binge watch whatever shows that we were going to cover. Honestly, some of the shows I had to binge watch were a lot to process. So by the time I post this video, only Lucifer and the Umbrella Academy have been the two shows featured, but... <sighs> Just wait till you see episode three. That show was a fucking hot mess. Nothing fucking made sense, but I had to force myself to watch this anyway. And I'm just like, God, is this shit worth it? Think about the money, Cindy. Just think about the money. Half of the shows I hadn't watched before. And then the other half I had seen before, but it was a long time since I had seen it. So I wanted to familiarize myself and also gather the quotes that I would use for the actual chats. It's not every day that I can say that I got paid to binge watch Netflix shows 
shows, but I will take that opportunity. I would pretty much just put the shows on in the background while I'm multitasking and doing something else. Every time I would hear a line that the character said where I would think, oh, that would be a good line to use while I'm chatting with someone, I would write it down in this giant Google Doc. I went back into that Google Doc and I organized the quotes. There would be a section for greetings, like what lines would I use if I want to start off a chat? There would be a different section that I put together for flirtatious lines. There was another section that I put for red flags. Pretty much any line where it heavily hints upon the character being the devil, like Lucifer, or just really any kind of red flag that tells you this person is unhinged. And then finally came the week of me catfishing a bunch of people. Originally, the idea was that I would go on any dating app like Tinder or Hinge or whatever and just use the character quotes on whatever matches I got. However, the legal team at Netflix ended up putting up a red flag and was like, no, you can't do that shit. They didn't want to run into any issues of us showing chat conversations of people without their consent. Even if we were going to blur out their photos, it was still something that they considered risky, especially if any of the people that I catfish would end up getting angry or something. So the solution that Dana came up with was that they would post a casting call for people to apply to be on a YouTube series about online dating. That way they would consent to being on a YouTube show. They would agree ahead of time that their chat messages were going to be public. They were encouraged to just talk as if they would normally talk when they're online dating. They also didn't know that it was for Netflix either. So it all seemed very low key. 15 people got picked to be on the show and they were given a list of dating profiles where they could read through it and pick which person they would swipe right on. These dating profiles are actually the dating profiles of the villains. They picked their top two or three choices out of the dating profiles they were given, thinking that it was like another person who auditioned and made it through the cut. The production company then set up a schedule where we were put together in a chat room on WhatsApp and tried to chat and get to know each other as if we were on a dating app. That week that I had to chat with them was like the busiest week of my life. I would talk to three people every night from Monday to Friday in 30 minute intervals. So I would spend the entire day at my daytime job and then rush to go back home to go chat to these strangers and catfish them with Netflix and then also try to make time to edit my videos that were due that week. I had no free time because I had to focus on all those three separate jobs that I needed to do. So I may have girl boss a little bit too close to the sun. Michelle, the main person from the production company that Netflix worked with was in charge of putting together all of these chats. She was the one who would message the dater and be like, here's your link to go in your private chat and talk to this person. In actuality, when the person is talking to me, the entire conversation was being recorded. You we were all on a Zoom call watching this happen live. After 30 minutes would pass for each chat, the producer would come in and say, all right, daters, your time is over. I will message you separately. She would message the other person privately and ask them what they thought about the date. And just for fun, she gave them some options to either kiss, date, or ghost me. There were so many funny moments while I was chatting with these people and I would be laughing my ass off with the producers in the background as we're like, what the fuck is going on? But again, I will deep dive into that later. Finally, after all of the chats were done, we spent the week after that going back to the episode script. Dana really put in the hours to structure the episode around the chats. I would come in and review the chat logs and I would add my own commentary to some of the messages that stood out to me. Pretty much the same way that I approached filming my Darkling video on Tinder. So in the final cuts of the episodes, a lot of the chats got cut out, but the actual episode scripts had me reading pretty much all of the messages. That's what I mean when I say that the episodes likely would have been over half an hour long if we had truly kept everything. Speaking of things being hours and hours long, that leads me to my final section, which is filming. By the time I flew to LA to film, we had the episode scripts locked down. We also had the wardrobe locked down. So you'll see in every episode, I have a different outfit that would allude to the character being featured. And I'll talk more 
more about that when I do a deep dive into each episode because it was really fun picking out the outfits. The production company organized everything for me. They sent me a list of three hotel options that I could choose. They organized the car rental for me where a driver would pick me up at the airport and drive me around. They scheduled a complimentary full body massage session. The producer had asked me before my trip if I wanted one and I had never received a massage before. So I was like, hell yeah. The driver took me to this fancy massage place where they had those water fountains and stones that are supposed to relax you. It had that calming meditation music and probably feng shui or whatever kind of bullshit that they always have in those massage places. So I was a very fancy girl that day until I got the actual massage. I was not prepared for the actual thing to be full body. <laughs> I absolutely hate feet. I don't like looking at them and I don't want anybody to touch my feet. I was messaging my friends and I was jokingly saying like, I'm waiting at the massage parlor right now. They better not touch my feet or I'll kill them. And it was all a joke until it wasn't. This lady came into the room. She had this tub of warm water. She asked me, have you ever done your feet before? In my head, I was like, oh no. <laughs> but obviously I'm not gonna be a rude bitch and be like, ill, don't touch my feet, you pavo. So I was like, oh no, I've never done my feet before. <laughs> What's that like? So she set the fucking bucket of warm water and she took off my socks and she started rubbing my feet. Her hands were going all up in my toes and I was like, oh, this is a very core traumatic memory that I will not be forgetting. After she was done with the feet play, she led me over to this other room where there was like this bed and I had to take off my clothes and lie on there like a fucking fish. The only thing that I kept on was my underwear. But other than that, I was full on nude, which is fine. I knew that was gonna happen with a full body massage. What I didn't know was gonna happen was that it would be so painful. <laughs> the most painful part was when she was working on my shoulders and my upper body because the way that she was going through it, I don't know if she was using her hands or using some kind of rock or I don't know, a fucking ax because she was basically carving down my back. Well, every time I knew she was gonna go up to my shoulders again, I had to mentally prepare myself that I was gonna be in a world of pain because that shit hurt. It was basically an hour of extreme discomfort. After we were done, she was like, I can tell you're really stiff in your shoulders and your upper body. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I am. Another thing that she would do is she would go down my back all the way close to my ass crack. And the whole time that I'm lying down there, I would be thinking, oh my God, is she gonna touch my booty? Did I even wash properly down there? I haven't had someone touch me down there in years. Something that she asked me afterward was what my star sign was. And I said that I was a Libra. And she was like, yeah, I can tell. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm like, what, what the fuck does that even mean? I don't regret it though, because it's a story to tell. <laughs> now I can say that I've had a massage and honestly, I'll take anything that's free. Then that night, I went to my hotel room trying to forget the very close intimacy I just had with that massage lady. I got dressed up to go out to dinner and obviously when I got dressed up, I was using the clothes that Netflix got for me. I was feeling like a bad bitch in town. I went out to get some sushi. They were covering my food too. So I was like, give me this, give me this, give me this. That. Let's fucking bankrupt these bitches. Just kidding, Netflix, if you're watching this, this is a joke. <laughs> then I went to bed in my luxurious hotel room with my booty hole quivering from the experience I just had at the massage parlor. And then the next day, the car picked me up to go filming. My morning was actually very chill because they spent most of that morning setting up the camera, testing out the lights, and all I had to do was just show up, eat breakfast, go to my room. Before I even flew over, they asked me what my favorite snacks were. They got all my favorite snacks on the table right there. So that was like my little waiting room in between filming. I spent that morning getting my hair done and my makeup done. I told the makeup artist to just do whatever she can to fix this shit. It wasn't until it was closer to the afternoon when I was finally called over to the set to start filming. There were a bunch of people and lights and cameras all staring at me. So 
<laughs> no pressure, right? It does sound like it would be a lot of pressure, but surprisingly, I was not nervous. There was a teleprompter right below the camera where I had the script. If I didn't have a teleprompter, I would have been so stressed out trying to memorize all of my lines. But because I had that available, I wasn't nervous. I felt like I was fully prepared for everything because the production crew did such a great job at setting everything up for me. Filming the episodes, it took a lot longer than expected. We were pretty much there from morning to midnight, literally midnight, 12 a.m. That's when we wrapped up. The reason why it took so long was because we wanted to film all five episodes in one day. I guess when people were planning this, they thought it would take a lot shorter than it actually was going to be. It just takes a long time to set up everything from like the cameras and the lighting. I think I was supposed to start filming at 10 a.m. But because those things took a long time, I ended up filming around like 11 or 11.30. There is a sequence where the curtains open up before I walk in to introduce the episode. And in actuality, there was a worker on each side of the curtains that would pull them apart. We had to do several takes where they had to pull it apart just right where it would be synchronized and it wouldn't be too fast or too slow or anything like that. Another thing that took a long time was the director was a perfectionist, which is understandable. A lot of directors are. So the first episode that we shot, we did like three or four different takes that was a long run through of each episode. Keep in mind, the scripts for each episode are really long. They are not the 10 minute videos that you see. I would go through the entire script of introducing the characters and I would go through the entire chat messages for each person. And remember, I talked to 15 people in total. So I'm basically reading off of 15 chat messages and also adding in jokes and commentary in between. And then to do multiple takes of that was a very time consuming. By the time we finished shooting the first episode, they were definitely like, okay, we have to figure out a way to speed this up. So from then on, we shortened it to only two takes per episode. This is where the teleprompter helped because if I didn't have the teleprompter, I would be forgetting my lines all the fucking time. If I were improvising, I would have been way too nervous to try to get this done under the time pressure. Like my head would be fucking empty. This is where the teleprompter was a lifesaver for me because I didn't need to like do any extra takes or anything. I was able to just like bang it out in one go. That's what she said. Anyway, so because we filmed for so fucking long, you would think that I would be tired by it, but I actually wasn't. I really expected to be totally burnt out from filming five episodes back to back, especially because I also had to talk to 15 people that I catfished and try to have some kind of interesting conversation with them, try to make them feel comfortable on camera and also try to add in jokes in between. That was when I truly had to improvise and just be on point with everything. But again, I wasn't tired. I was like, okay, I got a job to do. I just wanted to be the best, easiest to work with person to make sure that everyone else had as much of an easy time as possible. I pride myself in being very low key and low maintenance and we got this fucking job done. It just really goes to show that when you're running on adrenaline, you can get anything done. The next day I flew back home and then I just had to wait for Netflix to finish editing the episodes. Now, here we are. This video turned out much longer than expected, so in part two, I will take a closer look at each of the episodes that I filmed and talk more about the chats that I had. And obviously you saw clips of me meeting those people as well. We actually had much longer conversations. So I'm gonna bring in a little bit of the tea. Again, thank you so much for being here on this wild journey that I've been on because it was never my intention to be like a YouTuber or an influencer or even do anything within this type of field at all. But it's been really fun. I'll link the episodes to Flirting with the Enemy if you're interested in checking it out. Otherwise, don't forget to unsubscribe from my channel and goodbye. I'm not there without you. I'm not there without you. I'm not there without you. Girl, I'm lost without you. I swear I'm lost without you. All I think about is you.